everyone for coming here today. Uh, my name is Vishakha and I'll be presenting my talk on information-centric networking-based cellular multicast. So let's start with the introduction. As we know that the rapidly growing consumption of bandwidth by data-intensive services and mobile devices continues to put enormous traffic load on mobile networks. Uh, further, as more and more content is accessed on demand, cellular providers face the issue of spectral efficiency and network scaling. And in addition to this, there is this uh, upcoming of augmented reality and virtual reality, and therefore high bandwidth and low latency requirements become imperative, and cellular providers have to take note of this. So some examples of on-demand uh, uh, applications are vehicular networks, some on-demand content delivery, emergency networks. So what do we need? We need next-gen network with improved support for emerging mobility services. So what is the problem? Before discussing the problem, uh, let us first discuss what a network is supposed to do. Well, the work of a network is to deliver bits and enables communication between any or all parties. But what is the current state of art? Well, how IP does this? Well, IP accomplished accomplishes this using point-to-point -point packet delivery. If you have two points A and B, then a network is created which is the collection of links between edges and nodes and it finds a path uh, by chaining together a set of nodes and links between A and B and, uh, and after that packets flow through the pipe while all nodes A and B remain connected and operational. This is all fine, this is easy, but what is the issue? The issue is that as the nodes move, the links are going to fail, the connectivity will change, and it, to accommodate for this, end hosts have to do heavy lifting. There is no in-network support. So one problem is IP. Another problem is traditional unicast delivery mechanism deployed by the uh, cellular providers. Uh, unicast is of course one to one and it scales linearly with the increasing number of users. What is the problem? The problem is that as the users increase there would be heavy and heavy resource consumption and utilization. Even if the cellular providers use, uh, decide to use the multicast, there is a poor handling of multicast scenario, issues relating to mobility, handovers, and even justification of services are not addressed properly. So, regarding the, uh, 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 the possibility of the current cellular uh, RAN multicast, there are two deployment technologies that uh, generally cellular providers use. One is Evolve multi Multimedia Broadcast Multicast Services, in short it is called as EMVMS, and it is nothing but time division multiplexing of unicast and multicast subframes. It is fine, but the drawback is it loses out on peak spectral efficiency. I'm going to discuss more on EMVMS and SCPTM more in the f upcoming slide, but this is just an overview to give, uh, to tell the drawbacks of existing RAN multicast. The next point is single cell point to multipoint. Well, it covers the, uh, the drawback in the time division multiplexing of EMVMS by frequency division multiplexing of unicast and multicast subframes, but it still lacks why? Because it requires control information to be carried in data channel, becomes less spectrally efficient, and it is applicable to static media delivery. It is not suitable for full mode multicast or even on-demand multicast. So to uh, understand more uh, why we need an alternative to IP, uh, let me talk about what is an alternative to that. It's all about names and a simple request reply protocol. Well, in, in, in a information-centric networking uh, protocol, clients request data by a single name, ask the network to find and return the data. The reply in turn consists of the name only. There are no network, network addresses, no host names involved. All is embedded in the expressive hierarchical structured names. To uh, make this thing more concrete, let, let us look at an example scenario of smart homes. Uh, so, for example, the application is to read temperature, get camera feed, turn on a light, etc. The existing IP solution is figure out where to get this information from. I want this information from a thermostat, from a camera, etc. And the request and send that request to that particular address. But with the content-centric networking or information-centric networking, uh, you just send the request asking for the data. You don't specify what the uh, where where to get that information from. Now you might ask, wh what is the advantage of that? Well, it allows a lot of uh, 
uh, it allows us to build abstract network services such as multi home devices group of objects named content uh, because uh, i mean a single network object may consist of multiple devices or have multiple interfaces the service abstraction is inher is inherently multicast in nature and is thus well suited for um, uh, for wireless environment so uh, relating to these issues of ip of ip and uh, poor handling of multicast scenario and traditional unicast delivery mechanism what could be the potential solution well the potential solution is use icn instead of ip uh, we can use name based architectures such as mobility first uh, we create a dynamic and spectrally efficient uh, radio access network multicast and so combining these two icn and multicast we can get a information centric networking based multicast at radio access as well as core network so this brings us to the research question that we are trying to discuss in this work is that can information centric networking be used to achieve efficient end to end multicast so the proposed solution is we propose an icn based cellular architecture the question is if you deploy icn how can you tie the mac clear services to name identifier associated with an icn packet and to validate the efficacy of this design we specifically focus on a special use case of pull based multicast which is a highway in, uh, tunnel intersection scenario i'm going to discuss more on that in the uh, system model part of the slides So before going on uh, this is just a brief overview of what unicast and multicast is unicast is of course defined by a single sender and a single receiver there is a point to point communication between two entities broadcast is point to all points while whereas multicast is point to multi point i select few users and i send them data uh, and i send data to them in single transmission so why do we focus more on multicast We focus more on multicast is because multicast provides us a lot of untapped opportunities. For example, in IoT scenarios, uh, if you want to push firmware upgrade to your devices in one communication, you can use multicast. In cellular vehicle to infrastructure communication networks as well, you want to push suppose an emergency status update to all the vehicles crossing that region, you can use multicast. And the same for venue broadcast as well, where more and more for example you are in a super bowl stadium and you want to access the score and many users would try to access the score simultaneously and you can push the content to them in the single transmission and the same can be said for public safety as well so this allows the network providers to significantly offload the data from their network and provide the enhanced user experience and of course more revenue opportunities because they can serve multiple users in a single transmission So this is the multicast these are the multicast opportunities of course these are used by uh, of course this is capitulated by the existing ran multicast let's first discuss of on what is the uh, existing ran multicast 3gpp <coughs> is a consortium that specifies the standard bless you uh, in release 9 introduce embms architecture well let us first discuss uh, in detail about this architecture these are the user equipment user equipment along with e node b form the radio access network this is the core uh, network core network in the uh, emms architecture introduce new entities in the core network bmsc which is the broadcast multicast service center this connects content provider with the epc MBMS gateway MBMS gateway allocates IP multicast address to all the E node P that are involved in the multicast transmission and a very special entity which is multi cell coordination entity it coordinates all the E node Bs responsible for multicast transmission uh, does the session control and the brain of the multicast is basically MCE so this is the architecture how does uh, the transmission happen at the radio access network well EMMS uses two types of uh, uh, radio access network technologies one is multicast broadcast single frequency network in short called as MBSFN uh, which i'm going to discuss in this slide and the other one is single cell point to multi point i'm going to discuss later so what is MBSFN well in MBSFN all the e node bs involved uh, which need to transmit the multicast data to the end user they transmit the data in a single time frequency resource now why do they do that they they do that so that the user at the edge gets benefit better cell edge user performance and this results in higher overall efficiency uh, 
<laughs> this is fine. But what is the drawback? The drawback is that LT reserves special MBSFN or multicast subframes for this. There is a time, as mentioned before, there is a time division multiplexing of unicast and MBSFN data, and thus it loses out on peak spectral efficiency. Further, because different subframe is used to transmit the multicast data, UEs have to perform separate channel estimate, and in addition to this, they don't support uplink feedback and you don't know if the end user has got the uh, data or not. And therefore, HA, uh, HARQ retransmissions are also not enabled. So what can we do? Well, the potential solution is to, uh, is to multiplex unicast and MBSFN data in frequency domain. So the question is, how can REN, how can REN do that? To answer this question, let us first look at the physical resource block structure and the channels involved in the transmission or in the communication pattern in LTE. So this is a general uh, two resource blocks. On the x-axis is the time domain, on the y-axis the frequency domain. This is one resource block. A resource block is the smallest entity uh, of resource that you can allocate to the user. It's of uh, seven OFDM symbols. In, uh, in short, it's, a point, it's called as a slot and it's a 0.5 millisecond. Two slots combined to form one uh, subframe, which is of one millisecond. This is a 180 kilohertz wide with 12 subcarriers. The green part is the PDCCH, which is called as physical data control channel. This part is responsible for the UE uh, to let the UE know, okay, you have the data in this actual data uh, channel this is this yellow part is physical data shared channel so if you want to tell a UE that something is there in in so say this particular block you're going to tell UE to read the PDCCH the problem is that the PDCCH is scrambled with the CRNTI of the UE not all UEs can decode the uh, the control information uh, for that particular UE. Now, what is CRNTI? At e every attach process, the E node P allocates a unique identifier to the UE. So that is the way the E node B and the radio access network is going to identify. Okay, this is in in short, this is the layer two identifier for a UE. So if you have a uh, CRNTI, and with that CRNTI, it can uh, it can decode the data in PDCCH. Uh, it will get the information where that data is mapped to the PDSCH and get the uh, data. So we can derive this uh, an inspiration from this unique scenario for group communication as well. So for group communication, many UEs have to decode this PDSCH part simultaneously. So what we can do, we can tell them the same RNTI and with that same RNTI, they can decode the PDCCH, and after decoding PDCCH, they can decode uh, PDSCH. So for group communication, LT requires a mechanism to define the same RNTI for UEs in a group. Questions up to this point? You know, it's interesting. I don't remember any of this in your thesis. Is this in the thesis? Yes. I have this thesis. It's in, that, in there? OK. I guess I read too fast. All right. So, um, so, uh, so, th so the RAN multicast, the existing RAN multicast, which is the uh, single cell point to multipoint, uh, taps on this and it uses a single RNTI uh, to let the end users know, okay, now you can decode, uh, and in one transmission it can let all the users uh, decode that part of the resource block. So let's go to single cell point to multipoint. It uses the same EMBMS core architecture, the same BMSC, MBMS gateway, and MCE. But the difference with the MBSFN transmission is over here, it uses PDSCH for group data transmission. There is no separate multicast subframes whatsoever. And to enable this, two new types of logical channels were introduced, SCMCCH and SCMTCH. This is a control channel and the, this is the transport or the data channel. And both of them are mapped to the uh, actual data channel in the LTE structure. This has to be noted because the control information now is also carried in the data channel. And so let's, let's look at the uh, signaling part of this. From, core, from the core network, uh, uh, there is a handshake, okay, start the MBMS session. 
decide to use and now MC decides if it wants to use SCPTM or MBSFN. After deciding to use SCPTM, it will signal the E node B to start the creation of the data radio bearers, allocate the GRNTI, which is the group RNTI, which is the RNTI used by the group, the multicast group, to decode the data. And before this, it uses some form of signaling. So it SIB, SIB is the system information block. This is broadcasted to the UEs. The UEs that are subscribed to get the multicast content will decode this SIB. What does this SIB contain? The SIB contains the scheduling occasions of MC, SC MCCH, that is the scheduling occasions of the control information. And to decode the control information, it tells, okay, this is the RNTI that you need to use. After scheduling the MCCH, they get, in MCCH, they get the GRNTI. After getting the GRNTI, the scheduling of actual SCPTM data happens and the PDCCH and both PDCCH and PDSCH are scrambled with GRNTI. So, In so, this, so the first interaction has to be uh, unicast, right? Uh, the first uh, this e, -node, e node to UE interaction, right? It's actually broadcast. SIP is always broadcasted. But it would be decoded. So SIB is, to decode the SIB, uh, there is. How do you you already know the groups, or how do you? Like, you already know the group because they have it? already subscribed to it. Okay, so there's already prior interaction. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, after that, they will. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so I, I, they'll decode the uh, uh, the SIB and they'll get the SCMCCH scheduling occasions. But to decode this SCMCCH, it needs another RNTI. Mm -hmm. So in effect, the UAs are using three kinds of RNTIs. Okay. One is to decode SIP, one is to decode SCMCCH, and one is to decode the actual data. Mm -hmm. So we can see that it's pretty complicated. We don't need so many uh, signaling. So we try to, uh, I mean, take advantage of these drawbacks. You mean to make something better? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, so single cell point to multi point, it's, though it's spectrally efficient, then unicast, and of course MBSFN transmission, but it comes with significant drawbacks. It requires control information to be carried in the data channel, and it requires continuous monitoring of PDSCH because it has continuous, it has to continuously monitor when the control channel is going to come or when the control information is going to be mapped to PDSCH. And the modification period is also 640 milliseconds, which in today's terms is pretty significant, and it, it, it adds a significant amount of latency to the uh, multi to the transmission of the multicast content. And since it, it and as you mentioned, uh, everything is previously decided. There is no on-demand kind of thing. There is no, no pull base. So what we want to do is we, we need to create something that is inherently pull based because the uh, information-centric networking is, is inherently consumer-oriented. So, uh, to go uh, before we go into the actual design, let me first uh, summarize the uh, benefits provided by the ICN. It has the inherent capability of multicast, multi homing, seamless mobility support, and optimized data delivery. So, in order to utilize all these benefits, a complete overall of LTE or 5G core and radio access network is required. So, we can use, say, for example, mobility first at E node B and routers as mobility first protocol stack. So uh, these are the same, and I'm talking about mobility first, so I should mention what is mobility first. Well, mobility first is a name, is a clean slate name-based architecture, and as mentioned before, it uses names instead of the addresses, and over here, like uh, all the, the context, the content, the devices, all have names, and the names are assigned using a, uh, name certification services, and the names are then dynamically uh, bound to the network addresses using which is what is called as global name resolution service. So, before going into the radio access network, let's focus on what is the what does a flat core network look like. Uh, this this work is derived from the work previously done by Shreyasi. She she did this distributed core network architecture work. Uh, what happens in this is that mobility first protocol extensions on eNode B and co-located routers. And uh, so one of the main challenges in the legacy LT system is that it has a hierarchical structure in that the data plane path between 
E node B and the PGW is enabled by the GTP tunneling protocol. So for every UE, the e, the e node B and the PGW have to create a separate tunnel and then the separate tunnel identifier, which adds a lot of overhead complexity and latency. So we try to get rid of this uh, tunneling protocols by no by the, there are no centralized gateways and uh, it allows e node B to handle policy and QoS enforcement. And this leads to MMA being replaced by the global name resolution service. So what happens when the when the data packet arrives at the E node B, the E node B sends it to the uh, to the ICN router. The ICN router queries the GNRS uh, for that particular GUID of the content or the device, and then routes the <coughs> packet accordingly. And so the and the same thing: captured data at PDCP layer at E node B, sent to co-located ICN router without the need of tunneling. So this is all flat core network. So an extension to of ICN in the flat core network will be of I, course. I forget how is the tunneling uh, made uh, done. Is it? Tunneling, how is it done? So uh, tunneling between E node B and yeah, PGW. Yeah, yeah. So for example, if you say the incoming, the downlink packet, as the downlink packet arrives at PGW, which is the packet gateway, mm -hmm. it encapsulates the data packet. It creates a tunnel identifier. You can uh, you can think of it as a pipe. So it will be set, so it's it's a flow based uh, fl uh, flow based communication. In that pipe, it will be encapsulated and encapsulated by the address of the E node B, the IP address of the E node B, and then routed accordingly. When the uh, when the packet arrives at the E node B, it is decapsulated. Uh, see now, okay, this is coming from the PGW and get the actual IP address of the UE and then creates the, uh, starts the creation of the data radio bearer. So, I mean, it's all bearer based. It's not distributed. It's like focused towards a particular UE. So the extension to this is IMAC, which is ICN based RAM. And um, so after the network addresses of E node B's are resolved uh, using GNRS, E node B's are now required to map the content GUID or device GUID with the MAC layer of the requesting UE. Now this is done using the local name resolution service. And what is the local name resolution service? It maintains a map of the GUID with the RNTI. So this is the uh, this is the table that enables the mapping uh, of, uh, it ties the MAC layer services to the ICN packet or the name based packet. So now the question is how is this initially populated? Well, after every attach process, at each, uh, at each attach process, the UE, uh, we assume that the UE gives the GUID to the E node B. The E node B gets the, the GUID and after every RRC connection, a unique RNTI is is uh, is assigned to that particular UE. Now it knows the GUID, it knows the RNTI, it can go on to this local name resolution table and fill in the entries. So when the data is pushed from publisher to E node B, this is all handled by the ICN core network. When the data packet arrives at the E node B, the control part of the E node B will decapsulate the packet, check the GUID. It gets the corresponding requesting RNTI and starts the creation of the uh, data radio bearer. Any questions at this point? So, this is uh, in uh, this is in summary of how this thing works. So, the, another point is how the actual radio signaling works. Well, this is how it does. And coming back to the IC and multicast, how would how would this know? Uh, how would this thing let all the users know of one same RNTI so that uh, with single transmission multicast gain can be achieved? Well, it uses the paging message. The ICN enabled E node B will page both of these UEs simultaneously. In one paging occasion, you can serve around 15, 16 devices. So with so paging, what is paging? Paging is, is a way of the E node B letting UE know, okay, I have something for you. So after reading that paging message in PDSCH, the both UEs, UE1 and UE2, and suppose there are many other UEs, they will access, they will start the RRC connection with the ICN enabled E node B. 
for every RRC connection, the E node B will assign the same RNTI uh, for the multicast group. So in this way, both UE1 and UE2 have the same IRNTI and they can use the same IRNTI to decode the PDSCH and then after a PDCCH and after getting the information from PDCCH, it can go on decoding to the, the data in PDSCH. So as we see, there are no three kinds of uh, uh, RNTIs over here and the data part is also not mapped to the shared channel which was in SCPDM. So to validate the efficacy of this design, let's focus on a particular use case which is a pull based multicast. We consider a highway tunnel intersection scenario. Over here, we consider that as an E node B as, it, as, at, the, as at the starting of the tunnel. It, cre it, uh, it serves the region of 500 meters and the, uh, and the vehicles request for a content to this E node B. The system model is that the content requests are modeled by zip distribution. Zip distribution is, uh, I mean, the distribution uh, used to uh, see the content popularity. And alpha is the zip parameter, it's a shape parameter. More alpha means there is more steepness in the content popularity. So, so this highway tunnel, this is not a, uh, an IP tunnel, this is like a, you're thinking of a physical tunnel a car might go through. Yes. So, so what is the of what are you thinking of as the content in this pull base scenario? The content could be the status in the tunnel, one content. Uh, what is the status after tunnel? Where do I have to go? So somehow they all they all want this. And so how is this somehow, why is it really broadcast and not multicast? Like everyone should want to know this? Like no, it's this multicast. It's my, I mean, it would be a pull base multicast. We'll see that. Uh, because of the rate uh, request, uh, the rate of the content request, uh, the E node B would get an opportunity to aggregate those requests and serve those requests in a single transmission. So there is this philosophical divide between push and pull. So if you ask the GHN, he would tell you that it never makes sense to pull. Uh, so you could always subscribe to all the broadcast information and everything about the time. Is subscribe a pull or a push? It's the push. So it's like you, okay. But I, I think you know, it's like that. So you, like, you sign up with somebody and then that person broadcasts to you and you know how to pick it up. Whereas in this pull, the, we are letting people do what they do on the internet, just ask for content. If it happens that there is an opportunity to combine into a multicast, this network will do that automatically. So, so I mean, these are pull requests. So, they, they what what makes them come at arrive at the same time or arrive at, in, in a window in a window that you can serve them all at once? Is it the oh. yeah? So she has window as a parameter. Right. Uh, I'll discuss more. So, so the mean. So the question is, you say how how much can I aggregate? Is it depends on the mean arrival rate and the zip distribution. How can we calculate the mean arrival rate? Well, it depends on a very simple speed density relationship. If I know the density on the highway, I can get the speed of uh, every vehicle. Now, using that speed, I can get the time required to uh, cross this 500 meter area, okay? And I assume that while the uh, vehicle crosses that area, it requests for any content just once. So that will give me, and, and that would be the rate of, a of one vehicle, and if we have say 90 vehicles, then 90 divided by the time taken by a particular unit to cross that area. That would be the net uh, request uh, arrival rate. And request arrival rate for a particular GUID will be decided by the zip distribution, which is this. Right. So to make, make zip distribution more concrete, uh, as I have mentioned that the zip, uh, the content popularity depends on the, the I mean, the, this shape parameter describes the content popularity. If the shape parameter is 
is very low, say less than 0.5 or less than 1, say, it's kind of uniform. But it's, as it's greater than 1, the steepness in content popularity uh, increases. So this is what theta equals to 1.2 and we can see that the content which is the most popular is requested a lot of times. And so if we consider only the most popular content, I, I mean this graph tells me that I can uh, aggregate enough uh, requests given enough density on the highway and serve them in a single transmission. So shouldn't these things be, um, when you draw them on um, a logarithmic axis, yes, so don't they exactly. become straight lines? Yeah, they do. Well, okay, then, but they're not straight lines, right? Is it, but, am I have I misunderstood something? But this is not log scale. Well, your, your, your y-axis is. Okay, so wait, you have like, it's log pi, right? Am I misunderstood how these things work? All right, let's keep going. I'll, I'll sort this out. It's probably also my failing brain. Okay, so uh, we try to model these content arrivals using NS3 and the so, so, okay, so did you look at those numbers and try to figure out, well, at any given time, mm -hmm. how many people are requesting yes. and yes. you're, you're going to get yes. to that? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So content uh, requests following zip distribution, they exhibit temporal locality and uh, we consider GYD1 to be the most popular content and for that particular content we try to aggregate these delay tolerant requests by waiting a certain uh, period of time and serving those requests in one transmission. And we consider the actual uh, highway scenario, this is a Lincoln Tunnel scenario and I simulated this in the uh, SUMO simulation of urban mobility and uh, I simulated for various densities and for various densities, this, this simulator automatically gives me the speed of the vehicles and the mobility pattern for of those vehicles. So, so for instance, you sort of drew the base station in that spot there, right. kind of near the tunnel entrance. Does that also serve the people on the, the ramp? You know, we all have a lot of experience with this. Okay. Like, you know, like <laughs> sometimes it takes 20 minutes to go from like the, the right side and around the loop. Blah, blah, blah. I, I actually don't know uh, like what is the distance from here to here. Uh, it's it's I, kind of in the range of a cell. It's it's okay. kind of like if you're down here, right. there, over there, maybe yeah. 100 meters away or 200 I meters. That whole loop is about 0.2 miles. You think that it's 0.2 miles across? Mm -hmm. I think the loop is bigger than 0.2. I was going to say, you know, if the base station is here, like I think this <coughs> distance might be 200 meters, 100 meters. I mean, it's kind of like the the, the cars come in and they're up in the air, of course. We're talking about the distance across, but I think we are more to focus focusing on the cars which are, that are approaching coming. the... But yes, of course, it can, it yeah. can serve... I mean, you kind of have like a half-hour cell site sometimes, yeah. right? <laughs> like there's a lot of aggregation opportunity. Uh, okay. Right. So, the, uh, this is these are the simulation parameters, and since we are considering a highway tunnel, we're considering a free space path loss, free spectrum propagation model. Uh, classic E node B transmit power would be 46 dBm. Max scheduler is proportional fair scheduler. The mobility model, as mentioned before, uh, derived from the SUMO traces, and uh, I assume that there are only 100 uh, number. Uh, the number of contents are only 100, and the content size is 2,500. And I'll also talk about how the content size would affect the performance of the system. So, one evaluation metric that we try to address over here is the multicast gain. Uh, well, multicast gain is is a metric to quantify 
the efficiency of multicast in relation to unicast and uh, it compares the number of bytes transmitted in multicast and in unicast so this is it so of course it would be in the range of 0 and 1 and the value equals 0 there is no difference in the number of transmitted bytes the same it would be the same in multicast as well as unicast and this will give us 0 but as the value approaches 1 which means that the number of bytes transmitted in multicast are less whereas the number of bytes transmitted in unicast are more and therefore the del this uh, delta this multicast gain would be nearer to 1 so higher uh, the value of the multicast gain we can infer that the efficiency or the uh, like uh, higher efficiency gains can be obtained using the multicast transmission so this is the evaluation of the multicast gain for zip parameter 1.2 i have set zip parameter 1.2 so as to show that enough uh, requests can be aggregated and can be served with a single transmission on the x-axis is the system load of the number of UEs that can be served per 500 meter. On y-axis is the multicast gain and uh, zip parameter of course dictates the number of requests for the most popular content and as the system load increases of course the multicast gain also increases because you can aggregate more and more requests because there are more and more number of users. Now, why is there a drop from 90 to 100? Well, I infer that this is because of the radio resource, like more and more requests are going to collide in the uplink spectrum and uh, not many users can access the uplink spectrum simultaneously as the load increases. Another uh, way of looking at this is uh, using this histogram. I've plotted this against the aggregation percentage and the system load. Well, this gives us a clearer idea that for high enough zip parameter and for the most popular content and uh, if I have a system load around 90 UEs per 500 meter, I can achieve uh, like aggregation of about 45%, which is pretty significant, which means 45% of the users can be served in a single transmission. Uh, this is the comparison between unicast versus so, multicast. Uh, yeah, sorry. Okay. So, uh, how does the window work? Does that mean that's the how, that's the amount of time you you collect? You wait. First? Yes. Uh, wait. And is there any sort of notion of latency? You know, like if the if the information is important, you know, if I I don't want to wait that long. Right. Uh, if you, I'm driving fast through a tunnel and I want to get information, right. what was happening out? Therefore, it's for a delay tolerant request. I mean, if you're willing right, to so wait for is, yeah. at least one second, and I assume that the content is cached at the E node B, uh, like the most popular contents are cached at the E node B, then you can solve right, it. Okay, so, so you don't worry about it. So I would call them delay tolerant. I think that these are parametric how much you're willing to wait. Mm -hmm. uh, but one second is basically real time for a web content. For really slow. Drive through the tunnel. No, no, no. You're going to take 1,000 seconds to go, go past the link and then told it good. Right? Yeah, like, yeah, you yeah. know, yes, 1,000 seconds is kind of, you know, a good estimate of how long, if you're having a good day, of how long yeah, it is. Yeah, it's mainly like, to help the operator to get better efficiency right, right. in the network yeah. with trading off a little bit. Yeah. In, in other words, what you're saying, one second is negligible to our waiting time. Exactly. So, so, so uh, what happens if you looked at W equals 5 or 10? What would happen to these bars? I, I didn't evaluate that. Well, but kind of think about, think, can you kind so of, based I, on how you see how it works, can you kind of think it through and tell us? I looked at the traces and uh, for say, for example, if I take a load of 90 UEs, uh, it takes uh, around 10 or 12 seconds for the system to serve all the UEs. This was in the NS3 trace. So if I wait for 10 seconds, I can uh, basically serve all the users in one transmission. What, what is, okay, so I'm not sure if I understand exactly okay. what that means. Okay. So when the simulation starts, uh, suppose it starts at time zero uh, and then the e node B starts transmitting the downlink data 
The NSP traces show that it takes around 10 to 12 seconds for all the users in the system, no matter their uh, like content request, to get the data. So, it takes so that has something to do with that number 10 or 12 seconds is for some number of UEs, kind of. Exactly, yeah. Lesser the UE, lesser the number uh, it, uh, taken by the UE to serve all those UEs. So according to those traces, if, if you're waiting for 15 seconds, virtually you can serve everyone with a single transmission. But it depends, uh, like if it's, it's mainly for the most popular content because you don't know how many requests are going to come for 99, but you surely know that multiple requests are going to come for G1. Okay, so when you say serve all the requests in one transmission, you're talking about all the requests for a particular content exactly. item, like kind yes. of the most popular one, number yes. one. Yeah. So, so what happens to this bar? Is it then it would would uh, like uh, like on your bar plot, it okay. would go down to some number like between zero and five, or down to one, it would become like indistinguishable. Well, like so, so like if we just added another set of another bar to this plot for okay. W equals ten, 10 where, would yeah. it, where do you think it would be? I think it would be over somewhere over here. Right, very small. But would that still be true when you when you at maximum load, or would something different do you think happen there? Um, well, if the load is maximum, it would take more and more time to serve those requests because it also depends on uh, how fast the uh, the UEs can access in the uplink. Right? Well, yeah, you're telling me. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, it, it, would, it would be like that. If you increase load significantly, not all the UEs can access simultaneously and there would be retransmissions from the UE side you can run that you yeah. So maybe you can do a small table that kind of looks at yeah more relaxed conditions. Okay. Like I kind of think you know from a car driving perspective, 0.5, 0.8, and one are kind of the same with to to human responses. Yeah. Who are yeah. you know? It's maybe different if somehow your these are like vehicular messages intended for some part of your vehicle, okay. right? Like if yeah. somehow the car was processing something that want, that had, you know, but if these are like messages for for drivers like me, right? You know, yeah. I would, you know, yeah. yeah. But and then, okay, so when you went to higher loads, did the cars go slower? Like yes. next when you have more UE, so yeah. somehow in the model is a, Oh, at higher densities, the cars are going slower. Okay. And does that make your system better or worse in terms of this sharing, sharing that you know, fewer <coughs> well, transmissions? Well, these graphs show that initially when the system load increases, it makes my system perform better. But as, as mentioned, like then there is this race of accessing the uplink spectrum as well. So as you increase, as there are more and more uh, users in the system, uh, for uh, uplink uh, uh, scarce. Uh, I mean, the uplink resource is definitely scarce, and as well as I guess the zip distribution uh, kind of dictates that. Um, like, if there are more users, the content is going to be distributed more. Uh, different contents are going to be requested by different users. Then the steep popularity for GYD one won't be there. So, so I think you mentioned this uh, uplink a lot. Right. So, so the question then becomes, right? Uh, if you, uh, if you, if this is the bottleneck, right? Um, and then maybe you're trying to fix Holland Tunnel or Lincoln Tunnel at Russia, right? Uh, maybe you should do something about the uplink. Is there something smarter to be done than what is done now? So 
This is the impact of the content size and we know that Unicast performs worse for higher number of content size, whereas there is not significant uh, performance. Uh, I mean, uh, performance uh, of multicast is not significantly affected. And an important uh, graph is this. This is the impact of zip parameter. Well, if the zip parameter is, and this, I mean, let me first. The, the x-axis is the window size and the y-axis is the aggregation percentage. If the zip parameter is pretty low, it doesn't matter how much I wait. It's at one point of time, it's going to saturate. So, I mean, if, if, if you want to capitalize on more aggregation, you have to make sure that the zip parameter or the zip shape parameter is pretty high because tweaking the zip parameter provides the insight regarding when to aggregate and when to multicast. Is it, I mean, is it really worth uh, multicasting the content if the content popularity is not that steep? But if it is steep, yes, we can have enough aggregation, aggregation around 45% for window size of one second and significant system load. And I mean, multicast the inefficiency could be achieved. So this was all for uh, the pull-based multicast scenario. Uh, I have some results for push-based multicast performance as well. Uh, one use case is massive IoT. And the device uptime, I'm focusing more on device uptime is because uh, the massive IoT have limited, I mean, the devices have limited power source. So in SCPTM, there is a significant uh, higher device uptime because for SCPTM, as mentioned before, it has to check for scheduling locations of SCMCCH and SIB. And if I say that it is scheduled every 80 milliseconds, and this is the standard, and in addition to that, it has to uh, read the paging message, the device uptime is significantly high compared to 2.81 in iMac. And higher uptime, of course, leads to more power consumption. This is the device uptime, and <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> the next one is PDSCH occupancy. As mentioned before, that the control data of SCPTM is carried in PDSCH, whereas in uh, whereas the control of iMac is is done by the paging uh, mechanism. However, the paging mechanism is also mapped to the PDSCH, but the <clears throat> duration of the paging occasion is significantly higher compared to the duration of SCMCCH SCMCC scheduling. So this gives us the PDSCH occupancy of 1.32% and as compared to 0.07% in case of IMAC. <clears throat> and this tells us that it is also spectrally efficient IMAC design. So this is all. The conclusion is that we propose an information-centric networking based multicast protocol at Radio Access Network. We tried to study the use of local name resolution table and how it will perform at the radio access network. Um, some signaling was provided to, for, uh, to create a dynamic and spectrally efficient multicast. And we focused on two iMac multicast use cases, pull-based multicast, uh, studied the impact of window size zip parameter on the aggregation and push-based multicast. That's all from my side. Any questions? Mm-hmm. <clears throat>